Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. This is a continuation of us looking at one of the main concepts here in verse 14. Um, and remember, I am doing a Watchman series on the fire that comes down from heaven. The false prophet in verse 13 has the ability or the things that he does, the miracles that he performs, brings fire down from heaven. There's a really neat biblical explanation for what that fire is, and that's going to be covered uh, in, in this Watchman series. Uh, so we're kind of combining the two again, the Pure Bible Study and the theme around that in the Watchman broadcast, but we're going to go past that now uh, to look at verse 14. Here's what the false prophet does. He deceives. He's a deceiver. Deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So he uses his lying signs and wonders, his miracles, his bag of tricks, his, his magic, his voodoo or whatever it is. He's doing these things that to men's eyes they're going, Wow, this guy has power. Think of how they followed Christ when he went around performing miracles. And they were, they were watching him and many believed on him because of those miracles. And you see the same thing again. Here, Jesus prophesied that um, his disciples or his apostles would be able to do miracles, raise people from the dead and so on. And those apostles did just that and it stirred up the people. Um, in the book of Acts, here's Peter and John uh, right after the day of Pentecost, they're in the temple and they see a man who is lame from birth and he's asking for alms. Peter and John lay their eyes upon him and say, Silver or gold have I none, but such as I give thee, such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he went walking, walking and leaping and praising God. Okay, little song my granddaughter learned. But anyway, um, they did miracles and that spread out through all of Jerusalem and now all of Jerusalem's coming to Peter and John and here they are preaching the doctrine of Jesus Christ. That same idea now carried through to the false prophet. He does lying signs and wonders. Those wonders and those signs are meant to deceive. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 13 we see if there arise a, a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign and the sign of the wonder come to pass, then he's going to say, then he's going to drop it. Here we go. Let's follow these other gods that your fathers didn't know. Let's, let's go this direction. Let's, let's serve these gods instead of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. He uses the sign or the wonder to deceive. And I'm, I'm just telling you, a lot of these people, like Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts, uh, Ernest Angley, and many of these others, wouldn't have a ministry were it not for their lying signs and wonders. They, they produce a show that people want to see. And I have this by way of testimony given to me. Whereas people who have legitimate issues that require wheelchairs like they're lame in their feet, have a broken spinal cord or whatever, and they can't move or they have cerebral palsy or just different issues like that. When they're taken to some of these big healing revivals, they're not allowed to be like on the front or on the stage. They will hire people to sit in wheelchairs and pay them to act like they're healed. It's what happens. Goes on in America, goes on in Australia, South America. I've heard, it, I've heard it from people in Kenya. That's what they do. They hire people to act sick. Nobody ever goes up there with like an arm that's been, that's been withered and then watch it unfold right in front of their... Very, doesn't happen that way, okay? Or at least I haven't seen it. So they do use lying signs and wonders, and people are drawn to that. And I'll tell you, those people are the people who want to be lied to. They'll believe anything you tell them, as long as you give them the sign or the wonder. 
and these signs like the like healing ministries and now they're doing gold dust coming down from the ceiling and angel feathers dropping down those are lying signs and wonders um, these false tongues that are blown all over the place those are false signs false wonders and the idea is that everybody who can do these, obviously they had the Holy Ghost on them. Like, you know, in Roman Catholic churches and charismatic churches now coming together because they all have a common bond, and that is lying signs and wonders. So you see how perva pervasive this is and how it works. The Bible says, Revelation 13, 14, Deceiveth him that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. In Deuteronomy, I know I covered this last week, but I'm going to use this one verse out of the Old Testament, then we're going to go to the New. Deuteronomy 11:14. Moses said that I will give you the rain, or maybe I think it was God, I have to go back and look at the context, but anyway, it all came from God, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain. Um, God himself, Christ, said that he was going to come down as the rain, as the former and the latter rain. So here, we well just, I want you to put that in your mind, all right? So here is Christ. He comes down as the rain, and uh, he, is the, he is the rain that comes from heaven, which is God's doctrine. God said his doctrine should, shall distill as the dew, and it come down as the early showers upon the grass, all right? That gentle rain that comes down of God's word, to us is what blesses us, it what makes us grow. I was thinking of this the other day. All these wonderful plants I planted in my flower garden, they're growing this direction. They want to go this way. They want to reach into heaven, all right? Um, we planted, my wife and I planted flowers and all kinds of pretty stuff, and I had two back surgeries, and during that time, nothing but weeds, thorns, growing up out of that thing and at least one plant because I got out there the other day it was feeling pretty good and started pulling all those weeds out of there and all those little thorns I don't know what they are and at least one plant was choked out the thorns and the weeds choked out that plant and it's dead okay that's Matthew read Matthew uh, what is it Matthew 13 Mark chapter 4 about the parable of the seed and the sower that's how it works people get your thorns out okay and you're listening to me and you know exactly what they are okay so anyway that's what God said he said I'm going to give you the rain the first and the latter rain that's God's doctrine that's his word that's Christ that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil and I will send grass in thy field for thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full and then he says verse 16 take heed to yourselves this is on you you can blame all these people for lying to you and be mad, but you're the one that fell for it. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside. See it? Let's go this way for after the other gods and serve other gods and worship them. These other gods are evil angels, fallen angels, okay? And they, they're up here. Some of them are down here. But these evil angels are up here, and they're going to come down from heaven on the earth. <whistles> Watchman broadcast. Take heed to yourselves. Uh, serve other gods and worship them. Verse 17. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled. Look at there. Look at that word. What do you kindle? Against you. And he shut up the heaven and there be no rain. No more doctrine. No more word from God. God told Amos there's going to be a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread but of hearing the words of the Lord. He's going to shut up heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit. No fruit means burnt. Unless you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So that sets the idea of what we're talking about. Now we look into uh, the New Testament places where deception and being deceived is being talked about. Look at here. Matthew 13, 22 is the parable of the seed and the sower. And I want you to pay close attention to this. And I want, you, I want you to think now, as I read this or as you read it, I want you to think about you. All right? Think about your thorns and what they are. He also that received seed, what is that? It's the Word of God. 
receive seed among the thorns. What are thorns? Thorn, a little prickly thing. They sting. The sting of death. Is he that heareth the word, right? And the care of this world, John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The care of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. There it is. Choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. That whole charismatic movement is nothing but the deceitfulness of riches. That's what it is. Uh, Finnis Dake was one of the ringleaders of this. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, he writes this book called God's Plan for Man. Over the course of the years following, he wrote an annotated Bible called the Dake Annotated Reference Bible. And the Dake Bible is loaded every, to me it's the most confusing helps Bible I've ever set eyes on in my life. I got a copy. Somebody sent me one. And I look at it and I'm just going, man, this messed up. But his, his dangerous doctrines are in both of those books. One of the things he says is, now the heavens, heaven where God lives is a planet, just like the earth is a planet. God lives on a planet. And I'm just going, do oh, I know what that is. Uh, and then he talks about how Christians, real Christians, should never be sick. And if you get sick, you just proclaim it out, and then you're not sick anymore. And if you don't do that, then obviously you're not saved. You're full of sin. And if you die because of disease, it's because you didn't have enough faith to rid yourself of that disease. That's what he said. That's his doctrine. Okay? And... Oh, um, the deceitfulness of riches. He is also this, this wealth guy that says you just have, you just proclaim positive words and, and have enough faith in, in, in order to please God and do the works and keep the commandments and then you'll be wealthy. So he kind of started all that stuff. And he declared that if you, if you real Christians should die like Moses did. No disease, just, he just died. And he said if you die of a disease. It's because you didn't have enough faith and you died out of faith. Meaning, and he, he, he equates human healing with salvation. They go hand in hand. If you are sick, you're, you've lost your salvation. You know what Finnis Dake died of? Parkinson's disease. That's not like he was outside watering the grass and he killed over of a heart attack. Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, uh, Michael, J, uh, Michael J. Fox has it. Others have had it. My old preacher, Preacher Golf, died of it. It takes years for Parkinson's disease to kill you and you know you have it. You know you have it every single day. And the last couple of months of your life are spent in agonizing pain. So much so, this is what happened to my old preacher. Bless his heart. They, had to, they just doped him up on morphine the last few weeks of his life because the pain was so intense. That's how Finnis Dake, the guy who said you shouldn't die of a disease, that's how he died. I think God wanted him dead that way. But the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. In Mark, let me, let me add one thing here to this. In Mark chapter 4, uh, I'm not adding to the word. Uh, Mark is, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And here's, here's what we're seeing across the board. We're seeing a, the vine of Sodom take over in all the churches. So what happens is churches are now um, leading, the, my wife and I, when I was getting um, a um, a follow-up examination from my from my back surgery, the area of uh, where the Laser Spine Institute is is in Ladue, Missouri, or around that area, and that's the that's the wealthy part of of St. Louis, the, the St. Louis area. A lot of doctors, lawyers, businessmen, they've got tons of money there. There is a there is a Jewish temple there, a Jewish synagogue. And I'm not kidding you, as we drove by it the other day, I, sh I should have took a picture, as we drove by it the other day, they were going to have a, a rainbow Shabbat. They, they were going to have a gay pride festival at their tabernacle. There was another church, one of these um, 
one of these ritualistic Orthodox churches, main, mainline denominations, what they call it, that's like United Methodist, uh, United Church of Christ, um, Presbyterian, Episcopal. You have one of, these, one of these mainline churches was having some sort of gay awareness celebration or some kind of nonsense like that. They were advertising that the vine of Sodom has moved in, and it, and it's being it's being drunk by the churches, and the churches where it says the lust of other things it chokes the word out. Men's hearts burning with lust alters the word of God in their mind, so that what they're doing is okay with God. That's what they do. They just rewrite the Bible. The NIV is perfect example of that. Virginia Malincott, who was this butch, lesbian, male-looking woman, and she was that way when the NIV committee hired her to go over the language of the NIV Bible on her website. She identifies herself as a translator of the NIV. And the NIV has replaced the word sodomite in several places with shrine temple prostitute. So now sodomites are out and they replaced it with something else. What happens is sin and the lust of sin chokes out the word. And brother and sister, I'm telling you, do what I did Monday. Monday night, I came home. I got out my, I got out my gardening tools, put my gloves on, and I bent down in my flower garden. I'm not kidding you. It was loaded with weeds and thorns. And I dug and I pulled and I pulled and I dug and I about, I'm going, man, I've been sitting around not doing anything because of surgery for the last four and a half, five weeks. Man, I was tired, but I wanted them out of there. And the thing that strikes me every time, here's this, these wonderful plants that I planted, me and my wife, and they're trying to reach to heaven. And we had to plant those, and we have to nourish them. We have to be intentional with those particular plants. But all that stupid garbage stuff that you don't want in your flower bed, that just comes naturally, doesn't it? Comes naturally. And so if you don't want your life choked out by the thorns and the thistles and the briars and the weeds, get busy. Turn this sword into a plowshare. And that's how I did it. I just all that Johnson grass growing up in there, I just took the corner of my hoe and just started pulling up dirt and I'd pull them up and you got to get the roots too. You just think about that for a while, all right? That's, good. That's a good lesson. Every time I do that, it makes me mad and I, then I think of me. Mike, you got to work on this. You got to work on that, all right? Matthew 24, 4. Matthew 24, 1, 2, 3, four places in Matthew 24 about the end times. He's telling us, everybody, how do I know that? Because some say, now he's only speaking to Israel here. This is all for Israel. It's not for us. This is only for Israel. And that's not what Jesus said in Mark 13. Jesus said in, in Mark 13 is the same teaching as Matthew 24, just with some different, different angle looking at it. Jesus said, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. It applies to everybody. So you listen to this. Matthew 24, 4. Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. Looky here, looky here. In Deuteronomy 11, 16, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. Isn't that cool? Old Testament, New Testament. They're saying the same thing. The two are walking together in agreement. Mm, 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 mm. Take heed that no man deceive you. And I mean no man, including me. You be on your guard, be on your toes. I like it. I like it when people write me or call or message me and say, Pastor, we've been, uh, we've been watching you now for six months, a year, two years. When we first started seeing you, we weren't sure. So we just watched and we listened. And we can tell you that we agree with many things that you're saying. Some things we, we're not, we don't agree with you on. And I'm, I'll tell you what, I don't have a problem with that in the world. 
but a lot of people out there just said, you know what, I've been lied to too many times. Before I, before I start patting this guy on the back, I want to hear him out. And that's what they do. They listen and they listen and they listen. They're being critical of things that I say. They're taking what I said, matching it up against the Word of God. And so you are taking heed to yourselves that no man deceive you. I am capable of doing it. So as some of the other good preachers and pastors, some I fellowship with, some I don't know, that I would say, hey, listen to this guy. They're capable of deceiving, maybe not intentionally, but nobody, nobody, no one man has all of the truth of the Word of God. Not one. God won't let us. You know why? Because God is true and every man's a liar. Take heed that no man deceive you. He says in verse 5, For many shall come saying, or many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Verse 11, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Where does the false prophet of Revelation 13 come from? The earth. He rises up. Just like those thorns and those weeds in my flower garden, they all, they're just there naturally. They all rise up and they grow higher than what I had planted out there. And, the, and their leaves spread over and they just choke out the sunlight. You know what the sunlight is? It's the, it's the countenance of God. It is the sun of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. It's where plants get their energy from and their food from. They get it from the sunlight, you t and that's where we get it. We get it from the face of Jesus shining like the sun, and when that is blocked off from us, the word's being choked out. We're going to die. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall shew great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible... They shall deceive the very, which means truly elect. Very does not mean a higher stage. of. And I've heard some people say, well, the very elect is, is, is already going to be raptured at this time, but there's others, lesser Christians, who had sin in their lives. They, they're going to get another rapture. I don't, the Bible didn't teach that anywhere. I, know some, I have some people who follow our ministry that they think they can see that and... Amen, praise the Lord. I don't know everything. Maybe they don't. But I'm just telling you, the word very here doesn't mean the, the special high up, high degree elect. It means truly elect. And there really is only one kind of election. That means th that is the truly elect. There are fake elected people. They're not the truly elect. The fake elected people, the fake church members, are going to be deceived. This deception that's coming is going to engulf and encompass the entire world. And I think that instead of this group over here being Buddhist and this group over here being Baptist and this group over here being Catholic and this one being Muslim, I think all of that is going to change just like that and everybody is going to be he, the beast is our God now. I think that's what's going to happen. I think it's going to be one grand unified religion and people are going to change and they're going to be deceived by this massive deception. Don't know what it is, but it's coming. Romans 16, 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. You know what the belly represents? Belly represents the yearnings and the appetites. Okay, that's where, our, um, that's where our stomach is. It is where other things are that crave and desire. That's where that is. They serve their own belly. They serve their appetites. Verse 16, or verse 18, And by good words and fair speeches, good words, fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. They use, their, they use their speaking ability. They use their words to project and, and send out false doctrine. And the people who are lost are going to believe it. They may be fake elect. They may be fake Christians. They may be phony church members. But they're going to they're gonna believe the lies that are coming out. And the people who are selling those lies are doing so based upon their appetites. 
based upon their the the lusts of their flesh that's what that's why they're doing it um, it's it's just kind of like uh, and there's numerous numerous stories about this I remember there was a, a uh, one of these compounds, I think it was down in Texas or New Mexico or somewhere around in there. I don't remember where it was. But anyway, all these, there were several of these Mormon men that had taken in multiple wives and they were all breeding down there and all these girls that were getting 12, 13 years old, these men were burning in their lust over those 13 year old girls and then locked them into marriage. And basically it was just, you know, pedophilia, God told us to do that, okay? They're using their appetites and their lusts. They're serving their belly and making it sound like God told them to. 1 Corinthians 15:33, Be not deceived. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. How many times does God have to tell us to be not deceived before we go, you know what? I'm tired of men lying to me. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's, that's like the same thing of the lusts of other things, the deceitfulness of riches and cares of this world choking out the word. Uh, they corrupt good manners. Now, good manners is not, you know, salad fork here, steak fork here, don't put your elbows on the tables and don't burp, okay? That's not good manners. Well, it is, but it's not what he's talking about. Good, your, your walk of life, your mannerisms, how you project yourself and how you are both privately and publicly, those are your manners. And if you portray yourself uh, as, as decent and Christ-like in private and in public, that is your good manners. But evil communications like radio programs and in YouTube videos and sermons and TV shows and music, even even in the contemporary Christian music scene or the Southern Gospel scene or whatever it is, the gospel, black gospel music, they can be used to deceive. They are evil communications and they will corrupt, get good manners. And Paul says, be not deceived. Not everything on the Christian radio station is from this Bible. And you got to know. You've got to know. You've got to learn enough so that you can say, you know what? That's not, uh -uh, that's not in the Bible anywhere. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. That means you're, you yourself are a deceiver. You live one way privately, but you portray yourself publicly as another way. You're walking in craftiness. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. A couple things come to mind here. Number one, false translations of the Bible. Those who translated those handled the Word of God deceitfully. Number two, pastors, teachers, leaders who stand up and contradict the pure Word of God, they're handling the Word of God deceitfully. And they will, and they'll talk, especially if a guy knows that a majority of his church is King James, but he's not. What he's going to do is he's going to handle the Word of God deceitfully. He's going to say, I love you. Y'all know me now. I love the King James Bible. Boy, I tell you, this, there's not a book written like the poetry and the prose that's in the, and they'll say big flattering words. But right here in the original Greek, it really, it really gives us a different idea than what you see in the King James. That's handling the word of God deceitfully. You know why, you know what the deception is? Y'all know I love the King James. Privately, he doesn't. Privately, there's a, I saw a, a video put out. There was this ongoing war between Pensacola Christian College and Bob Jones University over the King James. Pensacola said, it's the King James. We're going to stick with it. We, we believe it's inerrant. We believe it's the Word of God. Bob Jones University took a different spin. I don't remember how many years ago. But at some point they turned, or maybe they was never this way to begin with. But they, they had, a, had a, a round table of all their scholars talking about how, how good the King James was. And when they preached, they preached out of King James. And, and, but here's what they revealed. In their, in their meeting on camera, they said, but we know as, as Greek scholars and Hebrew scholars, we know that the King James lacks in certain areas. 
they're handling the Word of God deceitfully. They're, tell, they're making it sound like we love the King James, even though it's not the best. We still love it. That makes me sick. Anyway, they handle the Word of God deceitfully. Here's another way. Uh, and this is the way Finnis Dake and several others, and I've pointed this out before. If I'm reading an article on some issue of doctrine, and, and some guy or woman is just way off, when I see them say something and then give verse references, not printing the verses out themselves, but verse references, and they'll give, I don't know, four, five, six of them, so that you'll have, if you're diligent, what you'll do is you'll stop and you'll start looking these up and making a note. And if what they said doesn't match what's in here, they handle the Word of God deceitfully. Many, I've seen many things like this. Finnis Dake does it almost like breathing. It's a, it was a second nature to him. He is the master of taking, he boasts about how his doctrines are based upon 500,000 verses of Scripture that uh, all back him up like God lives on a planet. Nope, not in here. But when he says God, heaven is a planet like the earth, he lists in his book about five or six different references in the Bible. And if you're lazy, you'll just think that they say what he says they say, but they don't. I, I started looking them up. I started going through his scripture references, and I'm going, that didn't say that, doesn't say that here, doesn't say it there. And what he does is he isolates one verse or a portion of a verse away from the neighborhood that it was in, the context, the circle. Remember, we talk about walking circumspectly. If you see a verse, if you're doing a word study using the Pure Bible Search software, you see a verse, you look at that, but you stop and l read before it and read after it. So you get the complete idea of, wh of what's being said there. Because anybody, anybody can isolate a part of a verse or a verse and come up with false doctrine. But in order to do that, they have to isolate it from the context that it's in and the context of the entire scriptures. What they don't, what they don't want you to think of is, is that while, yes, they have these verse references here, and yes, it may seem like it kind of says what he says, the whole context of the entire Bible contradicts that. Everything it contradicts everything that he's saying or she. That's, that's how they handle the Word of God to see. They can be using a King James Bible and handle the Word of God deceitfully. Lots of people do that. Okay? So that's why I'm telling you. Check it out. Go, st say, stop right here. You said that. You gave the verse references. Hold on. I'm going to look in my Bible to see whether you're saying is true or not. That's what you do. Um... 2 Corinthians 11, 13, for such are false apostles. And again, I love you, but I'm going to say this. If they call themselves apostle now, they're false. Deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. But they're not. The foundation of the church is laid upon the foundation of of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. There are no more apostles after John was the last one to die. And after that, after that, after Revelation, when, when it was signified in, Re in chapter 22, if any man shall add to the words of, the, of this book, I'll add unto him the plagues. If any man shall take away the words out of this book, I'll take his name out of the book of life. And I heard, a, I heard a, a drunken wolf pastor, somebody sent me a video and I watched him, and he's claiming that the book of Revelation was not the last book written in like A.D. 93, 94, somewhere around in there, 96, that it was written about A.D. 60 along the time of Paul and Peter and James and those other guys writing their books too. And I'm going, you ever, you ever hear something so stupid that you go, what is that? And I'm going, where, number one, where did he hear that? Number two, why has why he got to pronounce that? And I figured it out. 
It's because if we believe that the book of Revelation was the last book written, not, and, and by, by time and date as well, it was the last book written and placed in the last of our Bible. If we believe that, then we believe that after Revelation, no more words, no more doctrines coming down from heaven, none. They're all right here, all right here in the book. We got, a, we got plenty, all right? But if you believe that the book of Revelation was written early and earlier than some of the other New Testament books, well then obviously Revelation 22 doesn't mean all the rest of the books. It just means don't add anything to the book of Revelation. False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. There it is again, be not deceived, be not deceived. See that you be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You sow false doctrines or you allow someone to sow false doctrines into you, the fruit that comes as a result of that is not going to be Christ. It's not going to be the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be eternal life. If you sow false doctrine, you will reap the results and the fruit of that false doctrine. If you sow iniquity into your mind, your eyes, your ears, your heart, you will be defiled by what comes out of that. It's just it's plain and simple, isn't it? And he tells you, be not deceived. Don't be deceived by that, people. Ephesians 4, 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, uh, which is where the devil's walking, to and fro, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And here's what's interesting. Um, to and fro is how a snake meanders. To and fro, to and fro. We walk as straight as the gate and narrow as the way. We walk through a straight line, okay? But to and fro is this idea that it's like in Proverbs, the strange woman. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. All right? That's what that is. Carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If I had, if I, oh, I do. Do I? No. Here, here we go. Hang on. I have, I thought I had a quarter, but it's an, it's, a comp, it's an SD card. It's what we record our, you know, watchmen and Bible studies on, things like that. These things are amazing. Here's a 32 gigabyte hard drive, okay? It's, I just can't believe that they're that small, okay? But let me show you what the slide of mend is, is that I'm going to take this, I'm going to put it in this hand. It's gone. Okay, you see that again? I just learned a trick a long time ago. It's about the only one I know, okay? But I'm using what's called sleight of hand. I'm making it appear that I'm taking this in this hand and it's not there. It's in this one, okay? That's the sleight of men. They will get you to look here while they come in around you and attack you here. And, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Ephesians 5, 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. See it? We are not, this idea of children, you'll see it all through the Bible. You can be a son of God or a son of, a, son of the gods. You can be a, a son of God or a child of the devil, a generation of viper. You can be the children of righteousness, children of the day, or you can be children of disobedience. And all of that concept, it's not just a metaphorical idea or concept. It has to do with who your daddy was. It has to do with the seed that was, that was sown into your heart. Was it corruptible or incorruptible? Which one was it? The incorruptible seed produces children of disobedience. In, uh, did I say that right? Corruptible seed produces children of disobedience. Incorruptible seed produces children 
that have been born again and are of God. And that which is born of the Father sinneth not. And what that means is that new man on the inside of you, Romans 7, does not sin, period. Does not sin. It cannot sin. That's that new man that's, that's inside of you that's going to come out one of these days. And you'll be, a, you'll be a child of God, a son of God, born again, all right? But the children of disobedience have a different seed that's being sown into them, a different seed that, that is uh, conceiving them and birthing them. And, and people will deceive with vain words. Vain words are words like, your best life now. That's vain words. Vanity is, it diminishes over time. That's what vanity is. Vanity is buying a new car, brand new car. And that smell of a new car and the shininess of a new car, give it a couple years. It's going to stink like people, like cigarettes, like rotting food. It's going to stink. It's going to be full of dust. It's going to have dents and scratches all over it. It's vanity. Then you've got to go out and buy a new one just to have that new one. Okay? Vain words are the same thing. They, they sound good, polished for a while, but then they fade away. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you. Spoil you. Spoil means like when something is in the refrigerator and it's there for longer than it should be. We call it spoiled. And what does that mean? It means that bacteria and mold have gotten into it and the cold temperature of the refrigerator was not able to completely stop the spoiling process. Spoil means it's like when an army wins, they go into the village or the, the soldiers and starts taking all their stuff. They get the spoils of victory. And, and with like food in the refrigerator or food out on the counter, Never in the case of a McDonald's french fry, mind you, but it, with food like that, we call it spoiled because bacteria and mold have taken everything that is good and turned it into corruption. That's what it is. So we have, we can be spoiled. People can be spoiled, and what that means is all the goodness that was sown in them is being corrupted out and turned to rottenness through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, think of the Hebrew Roots Movement, because that's exactly what it is. They don't follow the Torah. They follow the, um, what is the other words for it? The, um, I don't know, the Talmud. They follow that. They follow the traditions of the Jews. They talk about the Jewish sages all the time and what they knew. And the Hebrews, because they followed the Torah, the Jews had a little special link with God that nobody else had. Who, who, who are you kidding? After the rudiments of this world, that is following after earth, air, fire, and water, the elements of this world. You're following after what this world can give you and the power this world can give you, like through witchcraft, instead of Christ and not after Christ. Second Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. I've mentioned this many times. And I'm, I'm going to mention it again because it's in the list here. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are going to try to convince you that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 does not talk about how God is withholding the rapture or the translation until the falling away takes place first and that man of sin be revealed because in their minds, well, it can't be that way. It can't be that way because I don't believe it's that way. They've, they've followed a, a philosophy full of vain deceit rather than following the Word of God. And so what they'll do, because it clearly says, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, that man, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So here's what the Swaggarts did in their Swaggart Bible. They took... That, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. They took that word apostasia in the Greek, and they said, and what, by the way, the Greek word apostasia, what does that sound like to you? Apostasy. And you get that, right? Okay? You get that. Apostasy. They're, they've fallen away. They, they can't, they're not, they're not saved. They take that word, they rest it. W-R-E-S-T, which means they twist it like two snakes or two wrestlers grappling one another. They twist it 
to where it says catching up first. So that day cannot come except we're raptured first, then the man of sin is revealed. That is handling the word of God deceitfully. That's what it is. And even guys who believe that, who use only the King James, they may not ever tell you that, but down deep in their heart, they believe that it should be that way. So what have they done in their mind? They've altered and corrected the Word of God themselves privately. Um, Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truth. Um, every t See, Clarence Larkin believed in what's called the gap theory, that between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there's an indetermined gap. And Genesis 1-2 in the King James says, and the earth was without form and void. Okay? Clarence Larkin, all through dispensational truth, took that phrase, and the earth was without, for, was, was without form and void. And he constantly and consistently wrote it as, and the earth became without form because that's what gap theorists do. They change the wording of Genesis 1-2 to support their doctrine because Genesis 1-2, as it is in the King James, does not support their doctrine. So they just alter the text. And Larkin does that repeatedly, and I'm pretty sure consistently, throughout his Dispensational Truth book. I'm sorry. But if you've got to change the Bible to support your doctrine, don't, don't be mad at me when I won't believe your doctrine, okay? I believe this book first, and if you tell me that the earth became without form and void, I'll call you a liar, because that's what you are, okay? The book is right first, and everybody else is a liar. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10, with all deceivableness, of unrighteousness. There it is. See that? See that? 2 Thessalonians 2.10? The man of sin is going to be revealed and he's going to come out with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And I'm telling you guys, listen to me, ladies, listen to me. Your sin is going to lie to you. It does. Paul said in Romans 7 that his sin deceived him. And by that deception slew him. Sin is a liar. And those pastors all over the world that are full of sin and, 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 and unrepented sin. And over time, it changes their doctrine, changes their preaching, it changes what they're saying. So they start calling good evil and evil good. So that they say, it's okay, God made you gay. Let's get married and other things. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received, it's either be deceived or receive the love of the truth. It's one or the other. They perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. You've got to ask yourself, do I want truth? You have to ask yourself, do I want God's truth? Man will supply a pseudo-truth that is right in several places, but distinguishably wrong in others. And God says, be careful, be not deceived, receive the love of the truth. And you have to, you, got, you just go before God. God, in all honesty, I've been in the Hebrew Roots movement. God, I was in the Charismatic movement. God, I used to be this, I used to be that. God, I've been looking for the truth and I'm, I'm tired. And I can't go on. And I'm tired of men lying to me. And I'm tired of falling for all these winds of doctrine and being blown around. God, I need a resting place. God, I want to know the truth. Even if it disagrees with everything that I've ever thought, I want to know the truth. And you prayed that and God sent you to his word. And you said, I'm going to stop right here. I found it. It was here all the time, 
but it was a stumbling block to me because I was told that King James wasn't right. I was told it was full of errors. I was told that I couldn't trust it. What you really need is the original Hebrew. What you really need is a dream or a vision. What you really need is this or that. You stumbled over the Word, and it was there all along. Amen. 1 Timothy 2.14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Ladies, I love you. I do. I want God's best for your life. And when you stop wearing the figurative pants in the family, when you stop going after every wind of doctrine, God will start working. And when you put your place in your marriage, God will start working some good things in you, and He'll teach you good, sound doctrine. Ninety percent of the issues that I've dealt with and pastoring over the years were at the hands of women. Bossy women, not, uh, not non-silent women, women who wanted to change this, who wanted to change that, didn't like the doctrine. I love you. God has a wonderful, wonderful plan for you. Okay? There's a reason why the women are to keep silent in the churches. That includes Joyce and Beth Moore and Paula White and Heidi Baker and all these other all these other false prophetesses. They're full of lies and deceit and the devil goes after them first. And men Stop depending on your wife to be the spiritual head of your house and to read the Bible because you're too busy or don't want to. Cut it out. You take your manly role as a loving and a cherishing husband and father and it is your responsibility to lead them spiritually. See, the woman in Ephesians chapter 14 was commanded to be in silence and if she wanted to learn something she was supposed to get it from who? Her husband. That would be you guys. Ball's in your court. You play it how you want to. 2 Timothy 3.13 But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse Waxing means it's getting bigger. Waning is smaller. Wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. People, people ask me, do you think guys like Copeland and all these guys, do you think they really believe what they're teaching or is that just some kind of charade they put on? Uh, here's what I think. I think in some cases, yes, they put on a big show. That in itself is deception. It's deceiving others. But I also believe that they themselves have turned away from the word of truth and have been turned over to lies and they actually believe some of the things that they teach because they teach it with such um, such emphasis and such heart that it, you, it, you find yourself kind of believing them simply by the, the manner in which they, they teach it. So I think in many cases they do actually believe the lies that it is that they're teaching. Beca and it says here they deceive and are deceived, deceiving and being deceived. Titus 1.10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. You know who that is? That's the Jews. That's where the Hebrew roots came from. That's where the divine spark doctrine come from. It came, came from the, the, the divine spark doctrine came from the J Jewish Kabbalah. Um, the uh, Big Bang Theory of physics and how the universe was created came from the Kabbalah. They invented the Big Bang long before the scientists did. They had this concept that Ein Sof, which is the Antichrist, um, that the entire universe was packed together and then it was broken in pieces all over the place and the pieces of Ein Sof, who is their androgynous god, male and female, scattered all over the place and this is why every human has a divine spark in them. That's where it came from, the, the circumcision. 
Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There it is again. There's a man that at one time was my Sunday school teacher as a youth here in this church. And I looked up to him. Godly man, bringing his wife and his daughters to the house of God. And he taught me for I don't know how long, and I listened to him. Man knew the Word of God. And I remember one time we were standing up, getting ready to take an offering, and I was sitting kind of toward the back, and he was one of the ushers. And I remember the preacher saying, uh, you know, something like, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're saved and you know it and you're on your way to heaven, raise your hand. Everybody's raising their hand, and he's just standing back there like this. And it wasn't like, you know, I'm fixed to take the offering. I, I have to hold this position. I could tell by the look on his face. And I went, what is wrong with him? Not too long after that, never saw him again. Dropped out. His wife and daughters kept coming. They, they stayed here for years. And those daughters are serving the Lord in various places. But him, he had too many women on the sidelines. And he chased them. Didn't have to run some of them too far. And his sinfulness deceived him. He made a choice. He decided that he would much rather just give in and live a life of sin then come to church. I'm telling you, sin's a deceiver, people. It's a deceiver. James 1.22, But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We are saved by grace through faith, but I'm going to read to you the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm not making light of that either. I believe in salvation by grace through faith. See this deceitfulness of sin? You know what it chokes out? It chokes out the Word and your belief in the Word. And you can blather all you want to about your doctrinal statement, but this Bible tells you no faith equals no salvation. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So here James is not saying anything differently than that. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. And here's the deception. The deception is, is that you get saved by some act of God, okay? And if you, from that point, you don't go to church, you can become a witch, you become a sodomite. I've heard people say that they believe they can even take the mark of the beast and still be saved. That's not, that's not, do you know what that is? They are deceiving themselves because they were hearers of the word and not doers of the word. And again, it's not salvation by works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 make that very clear. It is salvation unto good works. What I'm telling you is, those that are really saved, truly saved, the good works are there. It's manifest in them. They actually believe what they say they believe. And that's what causes them to repent of sins and do the things that God ordained us to do, like prayer, Bible reading, um, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, go ye into all the world and preaching the gospel. It's those things there that are the evidence of what God has done in us by grace through faith. But there is a doctrine out there, and I know there's varying degrees of that, and not everybody who says they believe in eternal security believe this. 
So I'm not bashing them. I personally, myself, can see nowhere in the Bible where true, genuine, very elect, genuine salvation is ever lost. But I also see that this idea of eternal security with no works to follow or deceitful works, that's not salvation either. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. That's what it says. And there are some people who don't like that so much that they've taken James, 1st, 2nd Peter, Hebrews, the Gospels, and sent them over here to Israel. Say, so that's not for us. That's for Israel. 1st John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. See, we have the righteousness of Christ. On the imputed righteousness, we are adorned with Christ. Christ, our righteousness. Paul said, not, not my own righteousness, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of faith, which is of Christ. So we have been saved, we have been sanctified, we have been covered with the robe of righteousness. But we also do a little righteousness on our own. That's what he says. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. It's right to repent, isn't it? It's not wrong to repent. It's right to. I mean, even if you fail and don't do something or do something, you re repent, truly repent. And God will bring you to that. He'll whoop the fire out of you. And you'll be doing righteousness. You'll be doing what's godly. Uh, Psalm 32, go read that. And then 2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. And I'm just going to point out to you, the NIV in 2 John 1, 7 has taken out in the flesh. They took it out. So the verse reads in the NIV, um, Many deceivers are coming to the world who, conf who do not confess that Jesus Christ is come. Period. They took in the flesh out. What does that tell you? That the NIV is a deceiver and an antichrist. Don't believe it. Don't fall for it. Go look it up. Okay. The, the, the main thing is we have 1,189 reasons not to be deceived. That's how many chapters there are in the book. We have so many great and precious things in this book. Reasons why we should not be deceived. So if you're deceived, it is maybe maybe some maybe some of you just were not necessarily willfully ignorant, but you hadn't learned enough and somebody got to you early. I understand that. And that's why God was faithful to pull you out of it. He let you stay in there a while so you can get so you can kind of get an understanding of what they're saying. And then when he brought you to the truth, you were looking back going, Oh, oh. They, that's what that was. That's why I didn't feel right about it. They were lying to me. There, it says it right here. Amen. Hey, I love you. It's good to be with you today. Let's study this Bible. Let's learn from it. Let's make our minds compatible with the Word of God. All right? It's good to be with you. God bless you. See you next time. Bye-bye.